Yeah. All right, and so what this is, is that we are going to go rapid fire through some topics and um, Swami, Mike, and Steve are just going to go around. You're going to have two minutes to debate your point. You don't need two minutes. If you can state your point in a sentence, you could be done. But I'm going to present to you a question. You're going to go through and debate it. You got two minutes to do it, and then we're going to go on. And uh, please be unhinged as uh, and unacademic as possible. You guys ready? So the first one I'm going to ask you is there is a ton of data that has come out suggesting that people should be using bougies, not, not only for difficult airways, but possibly for every airway. And for people who are airway snobs, you couldn't find, uh, you know, people who disagree with this more. It's like, oh, you don't need a bougie, this and that. And it's like, well, here's the papers, here's the data. And they're like, yeah, that's whatever, you don't need it. So my question to you all today, since you are all very facile and teach airway, is should we be doing bougies for everyone? Swami, you're up first. Bougie every time. The data is quite clear in expert hands. Bougie improves your first pass success rate. I'm going to use a bougie every time. And it's not because I own the largest manufacturer of bougies <laughs> in the country. That's not why I'm pushing it. I think anybody who is not going bougie first is in denial about the terribleness of their skills. And that's the bottom line, right? Because if you intubate 90% of the patients that you see on first pass, that feels really good. 90% first pass success rate, not acceptable. We need much higher than that. All right. Mike. Yeah, bougie every time. I tell the students, you use a bougie first line. Everything Swami said. That being said, I have started using a rigid stylet occasionally, and I do like it. I think if you're using a hyperangulated VL blade, a rigid stylet is a little bit better than the bougie as far as the geometry, but... Unless, you, unless you're using that, yeah, bougie every single time. I was a medic for nine years before I used a bougie, and the first time I used it, I only used it because it was hanging out of the airway kit staring at me. I said, let me give this thing a try, and I said, why the hell have I not been using this thing the entire time? Perfect. I got to be the contrarian, so I'll, I'll, uh, we'll just be contrarian to be contrarian. Uh, so you've got to do something every time. You've got to do the same thing every time. You've got to be prepared for that nightmare airway every time. The average ER physician does 10 intubations per year. You've got to do that 10 times a year to be proficient at it. So if the bougie is your thing, go with the bougie and do it every time. So you're doing those 10 airways a year with the bougie. But if you're going to do hyperangulated with the rigid stylet, I agree with you, Mike. If I'm using hyperangulated, I'm using the rigid stylet. Get good at that. Uh, get good at your one thing. If you're an anesthesiologist and you're tubing 10 people a day, sure, do one bougie intubation a day to stay proficient with your skills. For me, I'm a bougie first kind of guy. I use the standard geometry video laryngoscopy blade uh, with a bougie on it, my tube preloaded on it, because I know that bougie has saved my tail many times. Um, and, and I need to be proficient with it. So if I get in a situation where I have to have it, I'm really good with it. I'm familiar with it. My staff are used to it. And so I'm doing BG first every time. But if you're a hyperangulated guy with a rigid stylet, not my cup of tea. I like that DL blade. I like to be able to see things because you know, that's what I grew up with. Get really good at that. If you're only doing 10, 15, 20 tubes a day, get really good at an intubation technique that can be done on everybody. Your easy airways, your difficult airways, your anterior airways. Um, and you know, even your contaminated airways, which is why I like that standard geometry VL blade. I tried to be contrarian, but I think I ended up just agreeing with all y'all and I got 15 seconds left. You can have that sign back everybody. <laughs> I was really hoping that someone would go to time so I could just ding them out and just swap the screen. So hopefully we'll get there. All right. Uh, another thing that comes up quite often in, in trauma centers is the, uh, carrying whole blood in uh, pre-hospital settings, uh, whether or not we should be doing it, should we not do it? Is it worth the resource? This is something actually, if you follow Mike in his podcast, Mike, give a shout out to your podcast. Thanks. It's the world's okay medic podcast. <laughs> it's a wonderful podcast. On Spotify, <laughs> Apple, all platforms. It's more than okay. It's, it's awesome. But this is something Thank that, you. Uh, that I've been following on his podcast for a little bit because there's quite the controversy to it. Maybe not so much for us in the hospital, but I'm just going to turn it over to you guys and let you go first. 
So, Steve, what do you think? Pre-hospital blood? Ooh, blood pre-hospital. Uh, I'm going to try to be a contrarian if I can, but I'm going first, and who knows if I am or not. Sure. Your big urban centers, NYC, you're given lots of blood pre-hospital. You have lots of opportunities. You can use it. Sure. I live down in the sticks. I live in rural Mississippi. Uh, uh, we have, you know, our population, our county population is 30,000. Uh, and our surrounding counties are even smaller than us. And so I've got to think about what's the best way to use my resources. Where should that blood be kept? And if I have it on one truck in the next county over <clears throat> and the county on the other side needs it, they can be at my center before they can be a scene with that blood. Now, our helicopter services have blood on them, and I love that. I love that our helicopters have blood because sometimes they go way out in the sticks, and we can deploy them to the scene on these nasty traumas. But for me in rural America, I don't think it's practical to keep whole blood on an, an EMS truck because by the time we could get that blood to the scene with most of these patients, they can grab and go and get them to my shop or they can get to a major trauma center where there's more than just one or two bags of blood. Ooh. All right. Swami. I mean, I agree. I think it's a matter of volume. You really got to look at your trauma population. How often are we giving blood or how often are we in situations where we would give blood? And if you got enough of those, then you should stock it on the ambulance. There's no reason not to start a whole blood transfusion while you are bringing the patient to the hospital. Um, giving fluids to patients who have trauma and have blood loss makes no sense unless that fluid is red. So I like this idea, but it's exactly what Steve said. You really got to know how often are we going to be reaching for it? Having it on your helicopter totally makes sense. But if you only have like one penetrating trauma a year that you would give blood on, then maybe it's just not the resource you need. And you just need to get the person to the hospital as quickly as possible. All right, great. Let's go on to our next topic. Oh, no, I'm just kidding, my guy. You didn't ask Mike. You didn't ask Mike. <laughs> no, I know. The expert. The expert on the topic. Yeah. No, I purposely skipped I it because I know expert. it's boiling his blood. Uh, yeah, no pun intended. Uh, I actually agree with you guys that resource allocation is key. Do I think that every EMS unit in the country needs it? No, because it's going to go to waste and it is a precious resource. That being said, uh, I would look to the Broom study. It's Broom, Duchesne, Mark Peel was one of the authors. There is tremendous data coming out of New Orleans to show that uh, I think it was 11% less intubation, better GCSs. I think there was a around a 10% increase in mortality with each minute that patients in the pre-hospital environment weren't getting blood when they were in hemorrhagic shock. So resource allocation is key, but uh, yeah, I mean, it is showing that there are report, there's data to support it, but I, I personally have experienced patients where the last time I gave it, I had the cop on scene say, hey, do I need to call the fatal team out for this? And I, I went like this, like that. We gave the guy a unit of blood and he is alive and well right now. And I think, you know, two and two years ago, we never would have delivered this guy alive. There are some publications with some big names that are very anti pre-hospital blood. And I would shamelessly plug my podcast uh, to listen to my episode on that. There is a financial and ethical conundrum at play with the naysayers to blood. Do you, do you remember the podcast have, episode that that uh, so people can reference? It? I don't remember it was. It's also not for the faint of heart. So <laughs> listener discretion is advised. Well, we'll put it in the show notes for sure. Thanks, Mike. All right, let's go on and talk about uh, something that is, I think, controversial. And this is whether or not you, when you have a patient who comes in who's neurologically afflicted, whether that's uh, uh, hemorrhagic stroke or uh, status epilepticus, and you're going to RSI them, what should be the paralytic that you use for intubation? Is it going to be rocuronium and saying that you, you know, you'll get your neuro exam back later whenever you did, but the person need, you need to have optimal conditions for intubation? Or would you use something like succinylcholine so you can get your neuro exam back rapidly? Let's go with Mike first. I'm going to use whatever I have in the drug box. So I, I really, um, I did really piss off a neurologist in a neuro ICU one time when we had to use rock and he was very angry. And I said to him, you act like you're not going to put this patient right through a CT scanner. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I got. <laughs> I love it. I have made a little shift over the last few years. I'm using more sucks than I used to use. 
Uh, I like it in my neuro patient. I do like the neuro exam. I don't know that it's going to change a lot. Um, the biggest thing is I, I don't want them to be awake. I don't want them to be aware while they're paralyzed. And for most of your patients, if you're concerned about status, regardless of what their body is doing, you should probably be getting a stat continuous EEG. However, I work in rural America where I can't get a stat EEG at 2 a.m. And so my physical exam of the patient is all that I'm going to have. I still like rock. I grew up with rock. I, I have a soft spot in my heart for rock. Uh, but especially my status patient, if I can't get that stat EEG, I'm probably going to get sucks. And a lot of times when I'm standing at the head of the bed, I don't know logistically if I can get that stat EEG. And so let me let me just give sucks because that may be the only the only seizure monitoring that I have is my physical exam. And if something happens, we need to do some testing, we need to do some lines, and I really need to be them need them to be still. I can give a longer acting paralytic after that, but. Um, especially in status, I have moved to more silicone. I already know what Swami is going to say because he's a big sucks silicone <laughs> fan. So, um, oh, huge! Be short. I mean, listen, Haney and I are published on why Rock is the better drug. Now that's we a have flex. Been clear about this. That's a flex. <laughs> this is one place. Yeah, not the flex. But this you is one place it, where I do have a, a little bit of consternation in my head because I want to get that exam back as quickly as possible. I don't have uh, Sugametics readily available to reverse, so I, I kind of take all that into account. But I still come back to, I want to use Rock because Rock gives me optimal intubating conditions. It gives me a longer time of safe apnea. And while do I know that an extra 30 minutes of paralysis is going to be the kicker on this patient? No, but I know if their sat drops, that's bad. So I'm still going with Rock, but I do have some real consideration for sucks in this case as well. Nice. Well done. All right, let's go to the last one. And uh, Kenny, I'm sorry. I have to drop off. Uh, no I, problem. I thought I... I I'm a little, I'm a little behind. I, I didn't realize it was that late. It's sorry, all good, man. brother. We'll, uh, we'll catch up with you. Last one. No worries. All right. Yeah, sorry, guys. It was great seeing Please. you all. Great seeing you, Swami. Yeah. I'll act as Swami. Sorry, Haney. No worries. I'll be Swami for this last one. All right, here we go. So Perfect. the last one we're going to talk about is teaching tubes. So, you know, many of us are not only performing airways, but we're also teaching students on how to do it. So I'm going to go through be Swami. But the question is, is should you be teaching your intubation skills for the novice learner should you be using video laryngoscopy or direct laryngoscopy? And for clarity here, we'll, we'll say that this is standard geometry in both senses, because I think most of you will agree with me that hyperangulated is a skill set in itself. So video standard geometry, direct laryngoscopy, what are you teaching your new learners on how to, how to use it? Oh, it looks like Swami's up first, so let me go ahead and let me pop myself in there. Look at me. Look at me. Well, I'm published on this paper, and what I say is... <sighs> <laughs> Look, I'm going to keep this very, very simple. I think that if you are teaching somebody who has no idea how the anatomy looks like from the inside, I'm going to be teaching them with video laryngoscopy all the time. And there's a couple of reasons why. The first reason is that both of us can look at the screen together. So I don't have to worry about what they're looking inside or having them lie to me when they say they know what the uh, RE epiglottic folds look like. I can see it on the screen. We can look at it together and we can teach the anatomy as we go. Um, also, if they have no clue what they're doing as their first or second intubation, I'd like to be able to see where we're at and then be able to take the tube rather than waiting for a first, second, or third attempt that was failed. That's all I got. I'm a field training officer, so I get the paramedics when they come out of school. They should already know how to DL somebody by the time they get to me. I am teaching them VL every time because it is the quote unquote, I think it's an overused term, but it is the standard of care. It's just, it's the data is clear, better first pass success rate, better innovating conditions. That's what it's all about. And if I hear one more EMS provider say, well, what if the batteries go bad? Or what if you have a power failure? I'm going to scream EMS. They all want focus. They want the, the monitor, all the toys. But it's this VL thing that they're worried about, a power failure and nothing else. But I am VL first time, every time. But they better have their DL skills on par. Right on. Just in case as a backup. Love it. All right, Steve. So I don't want to agree with everybody. I'll try to be contrarian if I can just a little bit. So first of all, I completely agree with Mike. If you're in a situation where your VL blade stops working and you don't have a backup, that is a failure of your director. That is a failure of planning. These things are so cheap now. These things are so readily available. I've got two that sit in my sim lab that were given to me for free because they were just extras. Um, this is not, you know, 1995 where there was one in the entire system. 
you should always have a primary and a backup of a VL blade that should always be readily available. However, when I'm training, what do I train my learners to do? And I do what Haney does. When I, the first few tubes, we're both going to be looking at the screen and we're going to be looking at everything. I'm going to be teaching you the anatomy, making sure you know what you need to do. And then after that, once I know you know your anatomy, know you, you know how to do epiglottoscopy, you know how to get down there. I'm turning the screen away from you and I'm teaching you DL. Still hooked up to the VL blade. I'm looking at the monitor and I see what you're doing. And if you get into trouble, I'm turning the screen back around for you. But I think DL is a skill that has to be learned and it's not for equipment failure. It is for that really bad contaminated airway where you lose your camera. We're gonna, you're gonna be in that spot at some point in your career if you have it. And if you have never done DL, if you've never directly looked at those vocal cords without this screen beside you, you are going to be in trouble. So when I train, yes, my first few, we're going to look at the screen together. We're going to learn anatomy together. I'm going to teach you epiglottoscopy. I'm going to teach you how to get in the molecular. I'm going to teach you how to expose the cords. We're going to make sure that we know the same thing. So once I know that you have that down, the screen is getting turned away from you, and you are going to learn with your standard geometry blade how to do a good DL intubation. And if you get in any trouble at all, if you're struggling at all, I'm going to turn your screen back around, and we can use that to get the tube in. Um, but I think you have got to know how to do DL for that contaminated air where you lose your camera. I love it. Five seconds to spare. <laughs> all right, let's get us all up on the screen here together and we'll take Swami out. Yeah, I, I mean, we, we're, we're done with that segment, but I, I, I do like that approach. You know, start off with VL where everyone's learning together and then you're graduating to DL. I think it's a skill that everyone should know how to do when they get into trouble, but I think it's one of those things you really have to have a mastery of the anatomy before you get there.